Hi everyone in North America, Europe, Romania, and anywhere in the world. Thank you for tuning in for a new edition of uh, the Leon Ferraru conferences, one of our uh, permanent series uh, showcasing the best Romanian expertise in all things American, from history and international relations to arts and popular culture. Our guest today is, I would argue, one of the most astute commentators of international politics in Romania and beyond. An author and academic whose uh, no-nonsense expertise blends a uh, strict, uh, solid um, methodological approach with a long experience as a diplomat in North America and in the leadership of the Romanian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and with um, a philosophical foundation that informs a uh, realistic outlook on human nature and does on international affairs. Professor Valentin Naumescu, welcome to the program. Thank you, good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Um, we'll get uh, down to business uh, right away, as is the custom here at the um, uh, Leon Ferraru uh, Dialogues. Um, academics, pundits, politicians are um, uh, um, saying all the time that the world has become a very dangerous place. What do you fear the most these days? Well, indeed, saying that um, the world became a dangerous place um, is rather a truism today, but this uh, does not mean that it is not true. The world is full of, uh, is full of threats, um, but the world has always been uh, dangerous in any historical era. And I would say that most of the generations um, of the, let's say, past two centuries would have probably said the same, um, that uh, they lived in the most dangerous era uh, in comparison with their ancestors. Uh, so yes, the world is dangerous uh, today, uh, even more dangerous than it was yesterday. And there are a number of conventional and non-conventional uh, perils. Of course, we are afraid of uh, uh, getting sick, uh, and it's not only about uh, the uh, pandemic of COVID, uh, but many other diseases uh, of war, um, terrorist attacks, uh, of being victims of violence, but also the non conventional threats, uh, and more and more non conventional threats today such as uh, cyber attacks, for instance, including the possibility of losing our money, our house, our identity uh, due to the failure of the cybersecurity systems. Um, of course, we are afraid of instability and uh, losing our jobs because of this extreme um, level of instability. And I would say that um, the essential problem of our lives uh, becomes the impossibility of making plans and the unpredictability of everything from professional environments and career perspectives, uh, economic and social conditions, uh, personal and family investments, uh, of course, political developments, uh, to our children's lives. Uh, everything is now unpredictable. Uh, so it is difficult to plan something for the next two or three years, needless to say, uh, for the next 10 or 20 years. Uh, so that is my uh, brief um, um, assertion here that uncertainty yes. is our number one fear. 
it's um, it's indeed a very uncertain world, and uh, it's very frightening. Your <laughs> description, I must say, is that something? I'm sorry for that. I'm I'm not guilty. <laughs> of course, I mean we are in the realm of international politics and international relations, and it it should be like this. But are are there any specifics for southeastern Europe, our uh, our part of the world? Uh, do you fear anything in particular? for that part of the world and of course for Romania maybe. Well, yes, of course, there are um, several types of uh, constraints which are specific to uh, Southeast Europe, as you said, or generally speaking to uh, Central and Eastern Europe. Um, let's start by saying that the region is actually uh, hung between the great powers. Uh, that often showed each other hostility. Uh, let's just remember that uh, Central and Eastern Europe uh, used to be named uh, the, at the beginning of the 20th century, Zwischen Europa. What does it mean, Zwischen Europa? is the name that the uh, German historians gave to this region, meaning Europe between. And of course, they were referring the Europe between Germany and Russia. So that was the image of this uh, part of the world. Um, so uh, some of these uh, constraints I mentioned are merging from the position on the map of the map that we have. Mm -hmm. uh, others from other characteristics uh, of history, culture, I would uh, very briefly uh, mention. So on top, I would mention the geopolitical and, and historical perspective. Um, as we are a border region, um, how they see Europe or Central and Eastern Europe is a border region, um, we have to take into consideration that always the border regions um, are more exposed uh, to conflicts and, and clashes um, between uh, empires, between blocks, between alliances, than the center of the system because always the empires are first clashing uh, their periphery, the borders, and the final phase at the center. Um, so that was also the case with, uh, with uh, Romania, as we know, the territory um, lived by Romanians are on the intersection of the former Habsburg Empire, uh, the Russian Empire, and the Ottoman Empire. Uh, with all the consequences that emerged from this uh, very interesting uh, cultural intersection. Then uh, on the second um, position, I would mention the economic and, uh, and development deficits uh, in the region. I would say that um, um, we also have historic deficits of, of development here in, in, in the region taking into consideration that the region was uh, for a long time uh, under the occupation of the three mentioned uh, empires, the Habsburg Empire, the, the Russian Empire, and with its Soviet continuation otherwise, and the Ottoman Empire. Um, thirdly, uh, I would mention the uh, educational deficits, unfortunately. There is a uh, chronicle education deficit and generally speaking, a deficit of modernity uh, in the region, including uh, values, uh, fundamental values for liberal democracies, such as uh, freedom, um, rule of law, uh, human dignity, uh, etc. So these are very briefly just a number of specific constraints uh, that are affecting us in, in uh, Central and in, in Eastern Europe. But, of course, being a uh, border region, there are also other opportunities of being uh, the periphery of different spaces of influence. So, uh, so the threats are emerging. Do you think the threats are emerging from this particular position, geographic position, and from this historical, historical? Um, um, but as I said, as I said uh, some of them, some of them emerged from the, position are new. the map 
and, and they are called, uh, according to theory, geopolitical uh, threats or geopolitical constraints. Uh, others are historic, uh, um, economic, uh, social, cultural, uh, depending on different contexts uh, and depending on the dynamics of politics in, in Europe. But most of the, of the troubles uh, came from the position uh, in this uh, border region, um, meaning uh, possibility of conflicts uh, um, between great empires um, who were affected by um, both um, world wars in the second in the 20th century and then of course by the cold war so um now it's it's uh, much better than it used to be in our modern history you have uh, written extensively on uh, transatlantic uh, relations and of course looking at the uh, at the um, world affair of you know, on uh, looking at the international politics, one must take into consideration the transatlantic equation. Uh, but um, thinking that you know the 20th century was uh, called the American century because of the liberal world that the United States created. Uh, after the Second World War, based on liberal values, based on freedom, democracy, capitalism, um, a certain definition of uh, economic uh, economic development, uh, the role of um, civic uh, society and civic organizations, uh, what we um, what we see is that this liberal world, and you are one of the the authors, the uh, the analysts to draw the attention on this assault on the liberal order created by the United States uh, at the middle of the 20th century. Uh, so we have an old uh, world order that is under threat, under attack. Uh, is there any um, better alternative to this uh, liberal world order? Can it endure in the way it was uh, created? I cannot imagine uh, for the moment a better um, global order than the Western liberal order. But uh, indeed, uh, you're right. This order is, um, is uh, or it looks to be in, in, in decline, is under threat for many reasons. Maybe we'll discuss tonight. But, um, um, what it seems to be the continuation of this uh, liberal Western order, it would be what I mentioned in previous articles and in one of my recent books, a post-liberal uh, order, or a post-Western uh, world order. Uh, which is unfortunately uh, something very bad for, for Romania uh, and bad news for the region. Um, this idea is not new otherwise. Uh, of course, you know that uh, uh, it was um, Reid Zakaria, who the first one in 2008, uh, 12 years ago, uh, published uh, his book, uh, The Post-American World. Um, so we enlarge a little bit this definition saying that we could uh, face the um, challenges of a post-liberal and post-Western world uh, in the next years or decades. Um, what does it mean post-Western world or post-American as, as Zakaria said or post-liberal? It, it doesn't mean that uh, the United States won't be uh, the first uh, great power of the world anymore. Because it could be still the first great power of the world uh, uh, to live in a post-American world or in a post-Western world in the sense that uh, the West uh, could lose its um, um, capacity to uh, influence decisively the main political, um, uh, strategic, economic evolutions. Uh, we are already speaking about the multipolar 
international system. Uh, so that is the continuation of the decades of the unipolar uh, order with the American hegemon follow the end of the Cold War. So usually the 90s are considered uh, uh, the golden era of the uh, unipolar world with the triumph uh, of the liberal uh, democracy and um, uh, as uh, uh, Kuyama said with uh, what we believed to be at that time uh, uh, the end of history with uh, and, and we were so naive uh, yeah, at that time. Yeah, unfortunately it wasn't yeah. the, the case. Uh, so in yeah. this in this sense uh, uh, United States would probably uh, remain uh, the first great power of the world, uh, but uh, it is a long distance from being uh, the first great power of the world and to have a real decisive uh, influence uh, in certain dossier of international politics. We see that the US is leaving, for instance, uh, the Middle East, uh, Northern Africa, different hot uh, topics of global politics. Uh, they're not interested and they are leaving uh, the area, which is not good because any empty space is immediately filled by other other great powers and other influences. And if, of course, it's not good from our regional and national uh, perspective because we feel threatened by this lose of preeminence or global supremacy uh, of the uh, liberal democratic model and generally speaking uh, of the West. It is a, um, it, it is indeed a, a world that is um, shifting. There are uh, major transformations and you have uh, touched on many, on many of these uh, transformations in your book. I mean, in your latest book in when you, which you have examined um, what's happening with the world today and all these uh, trends that are uh, indeed uh, worrying for um, for a country like uh, like Romania, I should say, which is so much um, so much linked in terms of development and security uh, with this liberal order and with the um, uh, the American um, hegemony. But um, uh, in terms of this. Still, still on the liberal uh, order, on this world order. How, how do you see the destruction of this world? What, how do you see a, a scenario of dismantling this world war? What would actually happen? You know, when would, would we know that it was uh, it was dismantled? What are the signs that you are looking at when when trying to discern these uh, these trends? No, it, it, it wouldn't uh, happen like that. It, it's not uh, overnight. Uh, there won't be a morning in which we get up and, and suddenly we realize that we live in a post-liberal order. <laughs> it's not like that. But there are signs, uh, after signs, um, which uh, um, suggest us an insidious um, evolution towards a post-liberal uh, and post-Western order. And, and uh, what is um, um, most disturbing for us is that uh, most of these signs are coming not from the non-Western world, not from outside our strategic space, but from inside, from the West, we have these signs. Because if we only uh, notice uh, uh, threats or, uh, I don't know, um, um, different attempts to change the world order only from China or Russia, okay, Russia. and said but the West is united and we all believe in the same values and we all work together to defend this world order, that would be fine because the West could be, still is, uh, the main uh, driving force uh, today. But the problem is that the world is, that the West, sorry, is, is divided. And there are, are deep disagreements uh, within the Western world that are weakening um, uh, the force, um, the, uh, the influence uh, of the West. Um, let me um, give you just um, one of the most disturbing examples is the transatlantic uh, relation, which is absolutely essential for countries like Romania. 
we, we deeply believe and we support the transatlantic relation that is the strategic partnership between the United States of America and the European Union. And that is, I would say, the cornerstone of the West. But as we know, these relations are fading um, some years already. Um, it is not yet a fracture, I would say. There are some um, problems that are deepening. Um, I wouldn't blame only one side for this um, crisis, I would say, a long crisis of the transatlantic uh, relations. Probably they were, there were uh, mistakes made by on, on both sides of the Atlantic with um, um, happy uh, uh, with, uh, with uh, not very friendly because statement made by President Trump, but also um, um, the intention of, of some important European leaders uh, to get what is all the uh, strategic European, um, to make the European Union uh, strategically autonomous uh, from the United States. This uh, European a strong army, a strong military economy, capability yes, in Europe. Oh. Means uh, the political will of the European Union get out from the, um, the US umbrella where it was. Uh, after the Second World War, uh, to build its own military capacities uh, to um, become independent, so to say, uh, with the United States. That wouldn't be necessarily a wrong thing, the European Union to get stronger, because we are also pro-European, of course. Um, but uh, whether this endangers, for instance, NATO, that would be very, very bad and, and, and uh, very dangerous for us. Um, it looks at the beginning just as a matter of resources. We could say that all oh, it's all about money here. It's all about military procurement. Mm -hmm. France also has interest in selling armament. Uh, France has the most developed uh, defense industry in the European Union, and President Macron is interested in um, getting benefits, political and economic benefits, for, for this position. And we we suppose, and we have signs that European Union and, and France would be interested in um, convincing uh, the EU member states to purchase. Uh, much more uh, European made armament than American one. So this is just a um, one aspect, this uh, very complex issue. Uh, so I'm afraid that US and the EU are, are slightly separating. It remains to be seen whether a change at White House on, on November 3rd will make any significant change. Let me tell you frankly that we have a serious analysis saying that um, regardless of the winner of the US presidential elections, things won't uh, return to the previous situation in which they were, let's say, the 1990 at the end of the Cold War. This is not possible anymore. Um, there are some irreversible transformations that took place both in America and in Europe. We are still allies. Uh, luckily, we are still allies today. But we are looking very um, careful and, and, um, and worried to the trend of this uh, of this relation. Like so America. maybe in this sense, we, we can uh, also take into consideration the perspectives of a so-called Western order. And by the way, and this is, would be my last idea, this question, see that less and less uh, uh, politicians 
uh, journalists, intellectuals in the West, in what we call in the West, are using this term, the West. If you're attentive, for instance, in France uh, or in Germany, nobody speaks about the West anymore. West is a kind of a, a forbidden war, word. They're speaking, of course, about Europe, about necessity of uh, um, good relation or strong relation with the United States, but the West, we are only we are the only ones in Europe, the Eastern Europeans, who are still pushing this concept of the West. We remain with or within the old paradigm, the West. And French professors or Belgium or German professors, they're calling, why do you call this the West? The West is a concept related to the Cold War. Hey, get up. We are now uh, moving into a different direction. But we say, no, we don't want to yes. move into well. different. We, we still want to keep and defend the Western uh, order. So, no, uh, you could be very attentive to the political speeches of uh, President Macron or other important leaders in Germany, or in other Western European countries, they will never use uh, this word. Uh, we are speaking, of course, about Europe, about liberal values, about relations with the US, but they will avoid this uh, because uh, someone explained me, um, uh, the public perception in Western Europe is the, that the West means the domination of the United States over the Western Europe. This is the classical, I would say, the, the traditional uh, concept of the West, which they want to get rid of. It's, um, I think it's very important that you stress that some of the major problems come from the fact that uh, the West or the Western countries, uh, the, the divisions and the contradictions in the, in the, um, in the Western uh, Western Bloc, as uh, some of the um, some of the sources of weakening the um, uh, the world order, but I, uh, also in the, with regard to world order, uh, last question about uh, about what's uh, happening. How do you think it will translate in uh, for the status quo in uh, in Europe? Because what part a very important part of the liberal order was a certain status quo in Europe, and also one concerning the borders. Does weakening the, the world order, trying to replace it with something else, trying to destroy it, undermine it, we can use any word, would it translate in you know, dismantling the status quo and thus, uh, I don't know, discussing the borders again, you know, making them changeable uh, again. How do, do you see any parallel in, uh, in this direction? Well, not in the sense of um, changing the state borders, maybe we are not yet there because uh, for that we need uh, new treaties and we are far away from having new treaties. It's very difficult to change uh, uh, borders without uh, having new treaties. This is a complicated discussion. What is um, most evident today is that what is in danger is the principle of free movement. This is a fantastic historic achievement of the European Union. The free movement of the European citizens across the European Union with 28, uh, used to be 28, now 27 member states. Now, um, well, using different crisis, protects, a pandemia, uh, or years ago, migration crisis, and so on and so forth, different political leaders um, came with the idea of reintroducing border control in, in Europe. And that was an obsolete idea for many, many years since the Schengen Agreement in, in the 80s. Um, have to see whether after the end of this COVID uh, crisis in the post crisis era, um, the idea of reintroducing border control uh, will gain um, uh, more political support or 
the European Union will be able to maintain, to defend one of its fundamental values and principles, the, the freedom of movement. And I think here you have to look deeper in what is happening inside, because this discussion doesn't come only from politics. I would say this is a cultural change, a deep cultural change. And it's a, a switch from um, from one value, fundamental value, we used to be freedom for many decades after the Second World War, to protection. And we have polls in the Western countries, including the United States. A few years ago, that was the first time after, I think, uh, 1918, when the younger generation in the US uh, responded to the question, which one do you consider to be the most important value for you? And for about uh, 100 years, the American youth used to answer freedom. Freedom liberty is the first value, about 30% of them. So the, the biggest uh, proportion was with freedom, then second other values. But uh, uh, a few years ago, I think two years ago, it was for the first time when most of the, the American um, young citizens, I think the poll was uh, made for citizens below the, uh, the age of 25, responded that protection is the, the most important uh, value. And then came freedom on the second position. Protection like saying, security, like security, personal exactly. security, yeah. <clears throat> safety, exactly. so all these things. Yeah. Security, and then, of course, if you feel that you are threatened in terms yeah. of security, you, you must be threat, protected by the same. Yeah. Protection is the solution. So we are more interested in getting protection from the state, from the security, because you are you you are you are losing your security, the sense of security, then instead of being uh, eager for more uh, liberties. And I wonder whether there is a, a cultural explanation for this, uh, I would say, major change. Mm -hmm. and yes, there is. Um, this um, cultural change or this illiberal turn is probably generated by the fact that we have now the first generations um, without the memory of the war and Eastern Europe, the first generation without the memory of communism. It is very important because those who lived in communism and part of that generation, we will never see it, we will never see it of um, defending liberal democracy. We will always uh, fight for, for for the West, for the liberal direction, for the fundamental values of, of liberal democracies. Because we have this comparison in, in our lives. Yeah. My first 18 years of, of life were in, in communism. So that for me, it's, very, it's a very clear and easy choice. I don't have any problem in choosing between the two models. Oh. But for those uh, who are born after that who, or let they take say, it for granted. I mean, it's exactly they take it for granted. Everything, the freedom of, of uh, movement uh, or peace. Uh, I mean, for the Western um, Europe, uh, if you're trying to explain today the European Union or the European project, as we say, in the terms that it used to be explained in the 1950s, um, won't have any impact because. Essentially, the European project, the project of peace in right. Europe. But now, any uh, French or German youngster will say, but this is, a, uh, this is uh, obviously, this is self-evident that there's peace on the continent. There's no risk of having a, a war between France and Germany. Uh, or if we try to um, explain the need for European integration in Romania to very young uh, um, boys and girls, we, it, it's useless uh, to take into consideration or to mention communism and uh, dictatorships, 
because there's, they will not resonate with that. So my idea here is that the European Union has to find new political legitimacy in the 21st century. So we need to re-argue the European Union according to the needs and challenges of the 21st century. It's very difficult to keep the old speech of project of broad peace on the continent. What is peace? The peace is what they live every day from the moment of their birth or freedom of movement. This is nothing for those who have, uh, I don't know, 15 years or, or so. Um, so this would be the main, uh, uh, the main challenge uh, for the uh, next uh, political generation to re-legitimize, to re-argue in favor of the European project and in favor of liberal democracies. Because it's, it's indeed, I mean, it's very important because uh, it's striking, you know, when you look at the history of the European Union, why was it created, right? How it developed, what it has brought on the continent, you, you say peace, you know, but besides peace, there was a tremendous development, parts of Europe that for centuries, I think, had been, uh, you know, the backwaters of, uh, of Europe. And, uh, you know, it was probably people would, uh, would have believed that they were, um, they didn't have, they didn't stand any chance still developed in a way that it was truly miraculous. And if, even if you look to Romania, not far from Romania, not other countries, you know, to see how, how much the country has evolved after um, 2006, 2007, but I would say even before that, because this was a long process of European integration and you know so well, because you are, you are there at the, in the leadership of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs where we signed the, the agreement treaty uh, and um, uh, uh, the accession. And, and uh, uh, it's, it's amazing to see that, you know, by bringing all these good things, I mean, good, valuable things for the citizen, it's still you have a growing minority for the moment, but it's growing of people in Western Europe, and thankfully not so much in, in our part of the world, in Romania, I mean, uh, who are uh, against it, who want to dismantle it who criticize it as, it as if it was something like a tyranny, like something lack of uh, legiti uh, legitima completely lacking legitimacy. It's, it's quite, uh, quite striking. So that's why I think it's important when you say that it should find the way to re-argue why this is a crucial, really a life and death ma uh, matter, a crucial matter for, for all of us. Yes, in politics uh, is all about credibility. This is the first, the first value, the value number one. If you're losing credibility, you lost everything. And this is valid not only for politicians as leaders, I mean, but also for projects and ideas and institutions. And, and the, the main battle, most important war that is now taking place in, in Europe and in the West is the battle for credibility. Uh, and, and this is a very, um, I would say, very complex and, and um, with many faces uh, a, a dispute between um, establishment and, and anti-establishment in, in politics. Because all these anti-establishment uh, movements um, are, are fueled by um, liberal a feeling. Some of them are they're coming or they are attacking the system uh, from um, far right perspective, others from a radical left, because yeah. illiberalism is not only uh, far right, but it's uh, also a radical left, which is uh, growing and growing, not only in the United States, but also in, in Europe. Uh, both are illiberal. Uh, both these uh, uh, movements, uh, radical movements, because we are facing now uh, a process of um, uh, radicalization, ideological radicalization and polarization, uh, in, in which the uh, center 
uh, Please, the physical it's... spectrum is almost uh, uh, vanishing, mm -hmm. uh, while uh, the people are somehow attracted and forced to become supporters or, or, or one of the other of the extreme. Um, we are now um, now see these these trends in um, the United States, of course, because you are now in the hottest part of the electoral campaign. This uh, dispute between uh, progressives and conservatives, but we also have this in in the European Union. Maybe maybe in a um, milder version in in Europe than in the United States, and I will explain you why. This is because of the political system, the electoral system. Yes. In, 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 uh, in the United States, in North America, is the uh, major, majoritarian uh, democracy in which there are only two parties, first past the post, the, the, the winner takes it all. So you are a winner or you are a loser. There's no other alternative. So this is one of the reasons for this uh, very high polarization and, 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 and deep radicalization, I would say. But in, in uh, the European Union, uh, luckily we have this uh, electoral method called proportional representation. It's the PR system, uh, which uh, makes possible to have in the parliament or in the government uh, uh, more than two parties, three, four, five parties. And none of them uh, has a majority, so you need coalitions in order to uh, to form governments, which is uh, uh, which is essential for an European democracy to learn this exercise of making coalitions. And whenever you make coalitions, you're actually forced to negotiate, make concessions, you know, and, and make, make compromises and and to be milder or moderate in your. Yes, because otherwise you cannot uh, attract your partner yeah. in the government. So yeah, this is one of the chances we still have uh, due to the, this tradition of proportional representation and coalitions. But um, uh, on the on the other the other side, we see here in, in Europe uh, uh, more political fragmentation, and we used to have. 20 or 30 years old. So it's the reverse side of proportional representation. Too many because parties, too many uh, opinions. Ex, uh, exactly, because of the identity, representation. identity politics, because of the identity politics that is uh, extending uh, all over the world, um, there are more and more parties or factions, generally speaking, which are um, proclaiming their identity. And they don't want to negotiate, or they are very uh, rigid in defending their programs, their values. Um, we are uh, this, or we want this or that. Uh, if you want to make like that, we come with you in government. If not, we are getting out. It's very difficult because we need 50% plus one in the parliament to keep a viable government. So uh, I think for the European politics this time, this would be the main challenge to uh, reinvent the culture of coalitions. Mm -hmm. Only Germany uh, probably today still have this strong tradition of coalitions, but uh, in, in, in France, in Italy, in Romania, in Poland, in, in other maybe, all, maybe Austria would be another example of the yeah. sort of tradition of uh, coalition. Austria is also in a process of radicalization, of ideological radicalization, but we need to uh, relearn how to make coalitions, uh, to make compromises uh, with uh, parties or factions which are different uh, in, in, our, in, in, in their program, uh, which are differing from our convictions, but at least we are trying to find some common uh, issues uh, to go ahead with the, with the government. So none of these two extremes is good. It's not good to have a, a bipolar political order with an extreme radicalization and a, and a terrible fight and disagreement between two halves of the societies, as we see in America. It's not good to see an extreme political fragmentation and very unstable governments. 
uh, as we have uh, unfortunately more often in, in the European Union. How, how do you see the role of internet in these uh, political developments? Social media and, yeah. uh, and all these... Uh, used, these to, used to be for years and years revolutions. Uh, very, very positive in appreciating the role of the internet for its many, many benefits, we all know. But unfortunately, we have to be uh, fair and honest and, and recognize that in the past years, um, the communication environment uh, is getting uh, is getting worse, or from bad to worse, in in Western politics. Um, I wouldn't blame necessarily the social networks, but however, we are feeling that more and more people are living in bubbles, yeah. uh, in ideological bubbles, in political bubbles, cultural bubbles. Uh, this type of communication is distorted. Um, um, so, the communication environment is is deeply distorted in our democracies. And, and this uh, helps the enemies of the liberal democracy to um, gain field uh, in, this, in this battle, because this type of uh, uh, miscommunication, of distortion of communication, of uh, hate speech is very much encouraging the illiberal uh, trends. Uh, so you see, if you, if you ask uh, people on the street what kind of media they would like to, to consume, there are less and less people saying or mentioning the mainstream media because it's very uh, trendy, so to say, to consider that uh, uh, mainstream media is corrupt because they are telling lies from the government. And if you're looking to uh, Facebook or to other bubbles of communication, then you will find the truth. Uh, who are telling that truth? Uh, the enemies of the scientific expertise, uh, those are uh, telling us different uh, scenarios of uh, conspiracy. Uh, so the idea is here is to make the official institutions, the system, generally speaking, um, non-credible. I come back to my initial idea. So the fight is for credibility. They are attacking the credibility of the European Union, the Western institutions, it's the governments. Mm. Yes, saying that they are all lying, it's false. The virus doesn't exist. The mask is not, uh, is not useful. That's a lie. That's a conspiracy of, of the... Uh, Drug no, giants, uh, uh, companies who want to Big sell pharma, yeah, exactly of the pharma conspiracy, uh, or uh, I don't know, mentioning different names such as George Soros or whatever. So, Bill Gates, yeah. uh, a very um, prolific, I would say, uh, uh, domain or or space of communication the internet. Um, who reads uh, books today anymore? Less and less people are using books for taking their information. It's very easy to go on the internet, Google a little bit on the internet, and, and then you believe that you know the, the truth. truth. Um, and it's, this is the, the, the idea at the end of this uh, answer that people who still read books are always moderate. They are more inclined to compromise, be tolerant. Because in books, uh, an author, scientist, is writing his answer, his answer to a question in 500 pages. And explaining something in 500 pages means a lot of arguments. To show things in, in nuances of gray, not in white and black. But on the Facebook, uh, we see very important politicians who give answers in five words. Five words, you will always give very tough answers, very radical. And the public is more and more attracted by very simple answers. They are looking for the essences. They would like oversimplification of 
of the truth, which is not possible. We have to come back books, we have to come back to nuances, to intermediate truths, to nuances of gray, not to white and, and, and black. Uh, because this is the uh, usual answers that Facebook or other social networks are given. These guys are, are the angels, the other ones are the devils. Uh, no, it's not like that in, in politics. We have to be moderate. We have to uh, really try to understand. We have to look for scientific uh, uh, demonstrations to, to, uh, to facts. Uh, not to general ideas which are not verified or to labels. Um, as uh, the famous um, uh, the famous Polish opponent uh, used to say, "Gray is beautiful." I mean, in terms of this uh, nuanced vision of uh, things that uh, that uh, is imperative in uh, in politics. But thankfully, we are um, we have. Um, very close and strong relationship with the United States. The trends that you are um, evoking uh, um, seem to not touch uh, uh, Romania. We have a strong uh, um, a partnership, strategic partnership with the United States. The probably the the. Um, um, the strength of the Romanian American relationship has never been uh, bigger. Uh, we collaborate extraordinarily well in political and military matters, um, but still the relationship comprises, of course, as you know, because you served in uh, North America, the uh, relationship, and you know the partnership, strategic partnership very well, the, the partnership comprises other um, aspects like economic cooperation, education, um, cultural cooperation. What do you think that uh, is important to uh, have a rounded uh, relationship? Why, why to include uh, to strengthen other aspects? Uh, don't uh, military and political aspects uh, suffice? Uh, uh, why, why do we have to develop it to strengthen it even even more? Yes, um, your observation is, is fully right. Um, and I would start by saying that for Romania, um, for other countries in the region, the security guarantees are essential. That was what we lack uh, during uh, our history, security guarantees, credible security guarantees. And um, luckily, we are now in our happiest uh, moment of our history now in Romania, we have to say that, recognize that, being part of, uh, of NATO and of the European Union, we have both security guarantees and opportunities for economic development and developing our rule of law, democratic society, and, and so on and so forth. So starting from security guarantees, uh, that was the most important thing that this um, strategic uh, partnership with the United States brought us. This is a successful dimension already. This is a successful story in terms of military uh, intelligence, uh, the cooperation between the, the, uh, the Romanian and the American government. But of course, you mentioned other dimensions um, of this uh, strategic partnership. And this is a quite old desire of many governments and, and foreign ministers to enrich the uh, portfolio of the uh, US-Romanian uh, strategic uh, partnership to uh, new fields such as uh, economic mainly, um, but also to culture, to academic uh, uh, changes. Yeah. This is difficult have to be honest to recognize that uh, the, the progress um, exists. The steps are slow and, and they will be slow in the future, uh, unfortunately, because there are big significant differences between our societies. Um, not only that we are far away in terms of uh, geographical miles, <laughs> but we are far away in, in many aspects. 
first and foremost, there are two extremely different economies. The US economy is huge and uh, usually having major companies, they are looking for major markets. You have to be big to cooperate with, uh, with an American giant. And the Romanian market is not a significant one, uh, a very big one in comparison, let's say, with uh, Asian uh, markets. We know that. Uh, we are also different in terms of uh, culture. We are very uh, different in terms of academic uh, traditions. But taking into consideration all these um, uh, conditions, we are doing our best. Uh, when we say, when, when I say we, I include myself here as a university professor trying to develop academic relations with uh, uh, my American colleagues, uh, do research with them, but we have to um, cross all these historic uh, barriers. Um, maybe we are still perceived as a former post-communist country, uh, maybe poorer or less developed than other, other countries. So. Um, it's good that we have the United States uh, as a close friend of us in terms of military and uh, uh, and intelligence, and this is very important. According to uh, you, remember the most important uh, constraints of the region: the geopolitical and strategic uh, threats that we have in the region. But in the future, let's hope that we will work uh, more and with better results to improve other dimensions of this partnership in business, uh, investment, uh, culture, academic. It's a lot of uh, potential, but it's a, a little bit of explaining better uh, from Romania, of course, from our side, the opportunities that Romania presents for American investors uh, uh, and uh, the, the potential our country has in, in Europe. And I would say that there are progress and there are more and more signals that uh, many Americans are uh, starting to discover the Romanian potential in different, in different fields. We are not in the same situation as we were, let's say, in 30 years ago. It's better today, but we would like to be much better. Yeah, uh, I can attest to I can attest to that. Uh, at least with our uh, conversation and with the online program and the in-person program, hopefully soon, we'll um, have our small contribution to the strengthening of the uh, strategic partnership sure on the cultural and the intellectual <laughs> intellectual uh, yeah. level. Well. Um, uh, and, and uh, probably we should mention the fact that uh, in terms of the pro-American sentiment, Romania is one of the uh, it's one of the countries where this uh, this attitude, this positive attitude, is the, the one strong. of the countries. I would I would be very directly has the highest pro-American feeling in the European Union. You see, and even even more than that, which is I think a, a big asset. Uh, Professor Naumescu, um, I think our time is <laughs> is up. I'd like to thank you once more for having accepted our invitation, but My more pleasure. so for the uh, for your arguments in favor of uh, uh, nuance in term in um, in uh, favor of regaining the center, regaining a credibility, and for all these pro-American and pro-transatlantic and pro-European uh, um, European um, arguments. I'd like to thank the uh, our viewers, and they are a, a great number for being so uh, so loyal, and of course uh, transconcentric for co-producing with us uh, this uh, program. Thank you. Thank you very much.